drought can happen when we're disobedient, as the Israelis were. But I think for so many Christians, the reason that droughts come, and unfortunately the reason that they may stay longer than they should, uh, and the reason that you're not able to fight them off is because of a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge of God's word. Because if you knew God's word, you would know it doesn't mean that you can avoid a drought coming because the scriptures tell us when the storms come, not if. So the storms will come, the droughts will come. But if you know that the resources that you have by Christ Jesus, if you know what God has provided for us in terms of the power and resources, the blessing, the topic that we're addressing today, then you could deal with a drought, lessen its endurance, lessen its severity, and ensure that you come out at the end of the drought a much stronger person. And that in fact, you would not just go through the drought, but you would do one of my favorite statements, you would grow through the drought. See, sometimes, by the way, we attract droughts in our lives, problems and troubles, because we need to grow. <laughs> we need to be tested. And we think that God is testing us, but actually we're testing ourselves. We invite troubles ourselves, and we invite troubles by wrong thinking, wrong attitude, wrong actions, and so on. Disobedience, as I said before. So the reason I mentioned his message, which was excellent, is the fact that it causes us to think about why droughts come. And again, I said, as I said, one of the primary reasons is because of ignorance of God's word. Now, we always cite Hosea 4.6, and you can put it up on the board if you want to. Hosea 4.6, God is speaking to his people, and that's us. He says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, knowledge of his word. So that's why we teach God's word here, so that it will lessen your lack of knowledge. It'll increase your knowledge. And as I said last week, we want you not to just know about the word, we want you to know the word. We want you not just believe the word, but to know it. And you know it by experiencing the word. So that's the purpose of, purpose of our teaching. We teach the word because we're told in Ephesians 6, 17, and you can mark it down, you don't have to go there, that the word is the weapon that we use to resist the enemy. The word is the sword of the spirit that we use to resist and defeat the enemy. And we saw where Jesus did this in his encounter with the devil during the 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. We are to do the same thing, so forth. Now, we also teach the word because Proverbs 4.22 you can mark it down and you know this. It reminds us that God's word, his words are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. And we teach the word because Psalm 119, Psalm 119, you can write it down, 119, 105, tells us what again Elder Ivor mentioned in her prayer, convocation prayer, that the word, God's word, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Far too many Christians encounter droughts, as I said, and they cause droughts and endure long drought periods because they are ignorant, again, of God's word. So a key to achieving and living the victorious overcoming life is to increase our knowledge of the word of God. And this is clearly expressed, and I do want you to go to this scripture. It is 2 Peter, uh, first chapter, verses 2 and 3. Also familiar because we cite this often here. When you have it, tell me you have it. This is 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And in verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God 
and of Jesus our Lord. And three, as his divine power has given to all all things that pertain pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him again who called us by glory and virtue. Now therefore to avoid drought, to be able to endure a drought, and to be able to emerge again, as I said, a stronger person out of a drought period in your life, Christians need to increase their knowledge of God, that is of God's word. We need to have grace and peace multiplied to us in the knowledge of God that is of his word. He's given us all that's necessary. It's a done deal. And that's what this teaching is about. Uh, the series on with independence talked about the power of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that dwell in us. The word clearly tells us that they live on the inside of us and provide thereby all the resources and power that they contain to be available to us for any time of need or help. And to complete the task of empowering us, he also pronounces a blessing on us. The power in us is within us. The blessing comes upon us. So we're covered inside and outside. And so you really can't lose, but you have to know that you're covered. You have to know that these things are within you. And that's, again, is why we teach. A drought in your life would have much less severity, much less su success in taking hold, and a much lesser period of duration if you really believed in, knew the reality of those powers that we've been talking about that are within you and the fact that the blessing has been pronounced upon you already. It's not something to come. It's not something that you have to look for. It's not something that you have to plead for or beg for. You already have the blessing. Now, the message on with independence taught earlier this year, as I said, and this current message on the fullness of the blessing, they're intended to show you in the word that you already have the power and resources within you and the blessing of God upon you that give you all things pertaining to life and living. And this includes, by the way, for those of you who came up that have something to do with going to school, it, as Ella Iva pointed out, it will help you in your studies at school. If you stand upon the reality that you have the power within you. Now, uh, I've said this before, and this is a little digression. Because of what's within us, we have knowledge of the whole intelligible world. That is everything that was known, everything that is known, and everything that will be known is contained inside of us. And it's not that you have to learn this, you have to recollect it. And you recollect it through your spiritual channels and so forth. So I just want you to know that those of you who are in school, you already know it. And school, which is based on tuition, tuition is on the outside, it's drawing, it's putting something into you. That's what tuition is. Really, the process of education is more of drawing things out of you that you already, already have. That's why the Greeks coined the phrase educare. Educare means to draw out of you. You already have it. And unfortunately, our education system by and large doesn't recognize this, so they're constantly beating on you and actually closing off what you already have within you and so forth. But anyway, that's also a digression. Now, in our opening discussion of the fullness of the blessing last week, we established a number of things. First of all, the blessing refers to the blessing of Abraham, which comes upon the Gentiles because of the redemptive work of Christ Jesus. It's based on Galatians 3, 13, 14, and you can put that up. 
Galatians 3, 13, 14, and you can go there if you have your Bibles, which says this in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And 14, the redemption was for this purpose, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, I pointed out that the blessing is the completion of God's work of empowering us that began with the work in us that I described in the early series on within dependence. In that series early, earlier this year, I pointed out how the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell on the inside of us, which I just stated earlier, and has made available to us all the resources we need for help in any circumstance, any challenge in life. Now, the vast resources are in us and are designed to make us within dependent in that we can rely on the divine power and strength of the Godhead in meeting life's challenges, life's droughts, and also life's opportunities. Now, in meeting any drought that confronts us, we are not bound by our own limited human intellect. This is in our own limited talent and resources. We are to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, not our might. That's Ephesians 6.10. We are to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And also because of the power of the Godhead within us, we know the truth of 1 John 4.4, 4, which I said last week, which tells us that he that is within us is greater than he that is in the world. In other words, what exists outside in the world by way of challenges, by way of crises, by way of droughts, and so forth, any circumstance, any cancer, any, any attack, he that is within us is greater than this attack. We know that we will be attacked in the world by the enemy, but we meet these attacks knowing, again, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. That's Isaiah 54, 17, you can mark it down. Now, I pointed out last week, and I'll point it out again, and I think again this is something that Ella Ivor cited uh, this morning, that this power within us is further summarized by Ephesians 3.20, which declares, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power of the power that works in us. The power is already in us and it's already at work. And that power at work in us is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, continuing our review from last week, I pointed out that after providing us with uh, those vast powers and resources working in us, God completes his empowering of us by pronouncing the blessing upon us. This is the meaning of Galatians 3.14, which declares that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that's us, in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, the blessing comes upon us and represents, and this is important, the tangibility or materiality of God's favor on our life. It's different from spiritual blessings. Remember, one of the meanings of blessed is empower to prosper. Now, while we cannot see the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us that we just heard described in Ephesians 3.20, the blessing is something that comes on us, upon us, and is tangible so we can see it. Furthermore, it's important that it can be seen by others. It's not a secret. So re to repeat this point, the blessing is the completion of the empowerment process God began for us with his enabling us to be within dependent. Within dependence emphasizes a power of God that is deposited in us and comes from within, while the blessing emphasizes the favor of God that comes upon us and is external, visible, and available for you to see and for others to see. And guess what? It comes when you are born again. That's why I'm saying if you are born again, you already have the blessing, whether you know it or not. Now, to just make one final point about being able to 
deal with any problems, any circumstances, any droughts, any challenge, whether it's cancer, loss of a job, whatever, within us, it's important to know this. And I do want you to put this on the board, up on the screen if you can. And it comes from the Yolanda Adams song that we saw earlier with, with Sandra here, where the words say that the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. And I want you, and you can mark, here, we'll go to this, we'll go to Second Chronicles 2015. Can you put that on the board? The yeah, the scripture. Okay. Because, you know, we make these statements, and the statement is in Yolanda Adams' song, but it's good for you to see that it's actually from the word. So what a Second Chronicles Oh, you don't have it up there yet. I was trying to avoid going to it. Second Chronicles 20, verse 15. And now again, the Israeli army and the people were surrounded by this great, this great multitude of enemies that were about to descend upon them and destroy them. And listen to what's said in verse 15, this is one, one of the leaders of the assembly. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, uh, Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be dismayed, or do not be dis afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. Now, in terms of us, the great multitude that beset us, because as you know, it, 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 when it rains, it pours. So you're not, you're not in one drought. Usually, it's several droughts. In other words, if you're in a drought where you've lost your job, then you're in a drought that has to do with paying your rent. You're in a drought that relates to paying bills. Uh, you're in a drought of being able to get around and navigate in a, an automobile and so forth. So when it rains, it pours. The point here, what God is saying is don't be dismayed by all of these things that beset you. And students, don't be dismayed by the fact that you have five exams five days straight <laughs> at the end, end of the term. <laughs> you have the ability because the battle is not yours. Now, there are things that you have. That doesn't mean that you can sleep now for the previous six months, never open a book. But... <laughs> You are not alone. The battle is not yours, it's God. Now, you don't have to go to this one, but there's one more where it says that the battle is the Lord's, and that is 1 Samuel 17, 47. This is just for you to know, 1 Samuel 17, 47. Now, I marked it down because it's for someone who needed to hear that. So you always have more with you because the battle is not yours, it's not yours alone. Now, getting back to our topic, all of this leads to this question. What is God's purpose in his plan of empowering us from within and from without? From within, with the power and resources of the Trinity, the Godhead, and from without, with the blessing. This is God simply completing his plan of salvation for man, that's us, that involves redemption and restoration. This is redemption from the curse of the law, ushered in by Adam's disobedience, and restoration of dominion, which he also gave up by his disobedience. The blessing that God had pronounced on Adam and his existence in the garden. See, the blessing covered Adam and his total existence in the garden was suddenly lost, and it became a curse. And this curse lasted for the next several thousand years until the redemptive work of Jesus. Now, I also pointed out last week that I took the title for this topic, The Fullness of a Blessing, from Paul's statement in Galatians 15, 29. And I do want you to go back and take a look at this again. It's Galatians 15, 29. The title is taken from this declaration by the Apostle Paul. Here in Galatians 15, 29, he declares... And this is on the eve of his first visit to the church at Rome. Church had been established, but he had never been there. So he's writing them this epistle, this epistle that we read in the Bible, 
uh, to the Romans or the church at Rome. He says, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now, as I said then, this scripture is actually the foundation scripture for the end or last message of this message on the fullness of the blessing. The fullness is our end goal. But in starting the message with the end goal, I am proceeding, as I said last week, as God says he does in Isaiah 46.10. And I do want you to go to this because Isaiah 46.10, in fact, go to Isaiah 46.9, and we're going to read 9 and 10. And I'm doing this because the word, it's not only telling a story, the word is not only declaring God's word, but it's giving us something that we're supposed to lift out of it in terms of our own actions. And this is a good one right here. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Are you there? Now, uh, actually, I don't really have it written down here, uh, but the very end of verse 9 says, and there's none like me. In other words, I am God, there is no other, and there's none like me. And then 10 says, declaring the end from the beginning. He's saying that nobody else can do that. He's saying only I can see the end from the beginning. But as I told you last week, we are made, as you know, and we're gonna touch on this in a point, in a, uh, a little later point, that we're made in his spiritual image and likeness. So we are somewhat like God. And we can do some of the things that God does. And one is we can speak as God spoke. And we can also see some of the things that God sees. And we can see and visualize the end goal or the end objective to what we're pursuing at the beginning. And this is important because whether you're pursuing a degree in college or a medical degree, or you're pursuing marriage, or you're pursuing purchasing a home, or whatever, or getting an advancement on, on the job, you need to declare the end, meaning see the end from the beginning. And they will tell you, for example, if your desire, if your real throbbing desire is to own a Porsche, then they will tell you, get a picture of a Porsche, and put it on your refrigerator, put it in your bedroom, have it everywhere that you can see it. That it can constantly remind you that that's where you're headed and so forth. And then you can do one large enough and put a cutout of yourself in the seat of the Porsche. See yourself at your end goal. Very important. Declare the end from the beginning. And again, as I said, we can also speak as God spoke. God spoke the world and everything in it uh, through his spoken word. We also can do that. In fact, we're told in Proverbs 18, 21, you can mark it down, you, you know the scripture, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. It's telling us that we have the power to speak death or life to our situation, to our challenge, to the medical condition that we're facing, the financial condition that we're facing. We can speak like, we can say, in other words, you can say, this is the end, there's no way out, that's death. Or you can say, this is an opportunity for God to show up and show out on my behalf, and so forth. You make the choice. You can say, I know that this is temporary. I know that I look not at those things that are seen, which are temporary, subject to change, but I look at the things that are not seen, which are eternal, and so forth. Now, as we continue the discussion of the fullness of the blessing, we will examine the role of the Godhead, that's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, in this overall process. As I said in the opening message last week, God pronounces the blessing Jesus executes, I'm not, Jesus facilitates the delivery of the blessing to us, and the Holy Spirit executes the fullness of the blessing upon us. Now, in terms of the role of the Father pronouncing the blessing, let's pause and remember that blessing is God's MO. It's the way he operates. And let's go to Genesis 
turn to Genesis, and we'll be in Genesis for a while. Go to Genesis chapter 1, and uh, go to verses 26 and 27. Familiar verses, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis is at the very beginning of the... <laughs> That's why it's called Genesis. No, you know where it is. It's... We're going to look at chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Familiar to you. 26 says, then God said, let us make man in our image. And again, you know what our image means. Our, he's referring to the Godhead. He's referring to God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our image, according to our likeness. The reason, you know, it's not always spelled out. And I know uh, Elder Iva did this in one of her message, messages. And it is important to spell this out because you have people saying, well, you know, there were other gods. <laughs> Who was helping God out? No, it's the Trinity. Uh, but anyway, uh, in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. But this is what I want you to see. You know that, that, that verse. Look at the very next verse. That's Genesis 1, 28. What does it say? Then God blessed them. You cannot miss the point that immediately after he created Adam, the very first thing he did was bless him. And, you know, you, you read the scripture, but it doesn't tell you what he says or what he does or whatever. Does he put his hand, his hand on Adam's face or does he anoint him with oil or whatever? But you can probably assume, as I do, he probably simply said to Adam, be blessed, because he spoke everything, and he probably said, be blessed, as he also says in verse 28, be fruitful and multiply. He simply said, be blessed, and we know that to be blessed means to be empowered to prosper. Now, we can be certain that when God blessed Adam, Adam was fully blessed as in the fullness of the blessing. And why can we be certain of this? Because God does not operate in half measures. He doesn't do anything halfway. Adam was not designed to fail or to live in half measures. He was given full authority and dominion over the earth, and God made sure that he was empowered to prosper in the exercise of this authority with the addition of the blessing that he pronounced on Adam after he was created. Again, we will see uh, later when I get into the function of Jesus in this process, that the blessing comes on us when we are born again. So if you're born again, you already have the blessing. Now, uh, we're, I'm just going to cover this quickly. As the world became more and more wicked in generations after Adam, God became weary of the wickedness and decided, you know, it's time to destroy man and uh, who, who was his creation. So look quickly, you're in Genesis, go to chapter six, look at verses seven and eight. And we'll go through this quickly because I just want to get to something here. So the Lord said in verse seven, I will, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and the beast and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And that's how bad the situation became. But look at verse 8. But Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the rest is Bible history. You know the history of Noah and the ark. And it's through this intervention that mankind was somehow preserved. But what I want you to see is at the conclusion of the flood and the survival of the ark and its inhabitants, we find this in Genesis 9-1. Just turn, go up and go to Genesis 9-1. It's a very first verse in 9-1. In 9-1, it says, so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So we see here that God blessed Noah just as he had blessed Adam. Now, let's go to Abraham. We go back to Galatians 3, 13, 14, which says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that's us. The first thing we need to know is just how was 
Abraham blessed. We know that we get our spiritual blessing from Jesus, as we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. I do want you to leave Genesis for the moment and go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and look at this. Ephesians 1, 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of, of our Lord, of Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And if you study Ephesians, especially chapter 4, and you don't have to do that right now, obviously, you'll see some of the spiritual blessings that we get. So the point I want you to understand is that our spiritual blessings come through Christ Jesus. So what blessing do we get from Abraham? As we study this subject, we realize that Abraham lived before the time of Jesus. Therefore, he was not spiritually alive. God could not deal with Abraham spiritually. He could not bless him spiritually because he was spiritually dead. Abraham could not relate to God spiritually and God could not bless him spiritually because Christ had not come yet. Abraham, was, Abraham really was still a sinner and God had to deal with Abraham as a sinner, as a physical man, not as a spiritual man. Thus, when God blessed Abraham, it was a physical, material blessing that Abraham received. And it's this physical and material blessing that Abraham received is the blessing from Abraham that we receive, the blessing that's pronounced upon us. Now, let's see just how Abraham was blessed. And we begin this Genesis chapter 12. Go back to Genesis, go to chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 3. Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 and 3. Verse 1 says this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, that was Abraham's name before God changed it to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Here in verse 1, we see that to receive your blessing, you may have to leave your comfort zone. Now, this was not necessarily part of the message, but I think every time we see something that's instructive, we need to point it out. He's saying, Abraham knows he's going to be blessed, but in order to receive this blessing, he's got to leave his country, leave his comfort zone, which is his family, his house, his community, and his friends, and go to a land uh, that it says, and he says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And the reason I'm pointing this out is he didn't say go to X. He says a land that I will show you. So Abraham ex had to exercise great faith in God to just go to somewhere that he would be shown where in the future. Two things, out of your comfort zone, you have to exercise great faith if you want to receive your blessing. In verse 2, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Here we see that when you are blessed, you can be a blessing. In other words, you can't bless someone uh, with a month's rent if you can't pay your own rent. You can be a blessing. I mean, you can give a blessing when you are a blessing. And then in verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed, and in you, all of them. So people have to be careful about fooling with real Christians, born-again Christians, because, I mean, we have in the scripture, touch not my anointed, and that's referring to the preacher man, but it really refers to us too. People shouldn't be too quick to mess around and fool around with and try to do in Christians because we have some protection there. Now, how do we know that the blessing pronounced upon Abraham by God was a material blessing? We know, as I said earlier, that he, it could not have been a spiritual blessing because Abraham was spiritually dead. But we want to see some specifics as to what the material blessing was. So turn to the next chapter in Genesis chapter 13, and we'll look and see how Abraham was blessed. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. 
very rich. It could have said he was rich, but it says very rich. Now, that's important. Now, look at uh, Genesis. You're right there in 13. Look at verses 14 and 15. The word says in verse 14, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. That's quite a blessing. Now, here I want to digress a little bit too and point out that we're being instructed, instructed here again about something we need to do, and it relates to Isaiah 46.10. We see a clear example of the importance of visualization, seeing your goal. God was asking Abraham or Abram to see, to visualize the scope and reach of the land that would be given to him. If you can't see or visualize your goal, you won't achieve it. This goes back again to Isaiah 46.10, seeing the end at the beginning. Now remember the four steps to achieving a goal or objective that we spelled out earlier this year and more than one time. The very first thing is visualization. Visualize, see your goal. That's the conception of your goal, visualize it. That's what God is telling Abraham here. And that's what's being told in Isaiah 46.10. The second one is to internalize your goal. That is to believe it in your heart, get it down inside you where nothing can shake it from you and you believe it in your heart. The third step is to verbalize it, to speak and confess your goal. You speak it, and you could be speaking it to yourself looking in the mirror. You know, I will be. This will happen. And I told you the story of Apostle Price when he didn't have a pot to cook in, but he had come into an understanding of the word. He was walking around his house saying, I am rich, I am rich, I am rich. And the girls thought he was crazy because things looked like they were falling apart because he wasn't repairing anything. He decided to get out of debt so he wasn't gonna spend money on new things until he was out of debt. You verbalize it. And finally, uh, it materializes. It appears on the material plane. Uh, that's just an aside also. So everything begins with visualization and that's what uh, God was telling Abraham. Now turn with me to Genesis 22, chapter 22, and we're gonna look at a number of things here. I'm gonna read them quickly. Uh, in verse 1, Genesis 20, it says, Now it came to pass, because this is where, you know, actually what I can do is maybe just summarize this because you know the story. The whole story is contained in Genesis 22, 1 through 18. This is where Abraham is tested. He's asked by God to offer his son Isaac, his only son, up to the Lord as a burnt offering. And... So he instructs him where to go, what mountain to go, and, and uh, Abraham prepares this journey with the wood. He takes a couple of his young workmen with him along with Isaac, and he reaches a point, and he builds the altar, and he bounds Isaac and puts him on the altar of the wood. Uh, but this is what happens. Look at verse 12. An angel of the Lord, this is in verse 11, called to him from heaven. He says, and he said, do not lay hand, your hand on the lad do, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. 13, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. Now I'm mentioning this because so often the very help that we need in a given situation is right at hand. That's what a ram in the thicket is. It's something that's right. In this case, it was behind him. Sometimes the very thing that we need is right there. Uh, ladies, sometimes the man of your dreams is sometimes that best friend that you've never considered romantically, but the person that has known you all your life and so forth. I'm saying sometimes, not all the time. <laughs> Same thing with men, that sometimes the person that you should be with has been around you for years. Uh, anyway, that's probably for somebody. <laughs> and so the uh, son was saved. And 14, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. And that 
is so true. The Lord will provide. Then the angel of the Lord called, this is 15, called to Abram a second time out of heaven and said, 16, and by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. You have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. God is saying that Abraham and his descendants will be able to resist and defeat their enemies. Uh, and that he is not only the God of blessing, but he's the God of multiplication, which he is. Uh, and finally, in 18, he says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Important thing here, Abraham was blessed because he was obedient to God. We are blessed today when we, we obey his voice also. Where do we find uh, uh, God's voice? In the Word, the Bible. You can pick up and open the Bible any day, almost anywhere, and you will see God speaking to you, and so on. So if we do what the Word says, if we're obedient, that will enable the blessing to flow more freely upon us. Uh, and the Word has so many things. I have a lot of examples here. But I won't give them. I may come back to them later. Where the word says do this, and you just need to do it. So this I will say, since we are blessed materially through Abraham, it's important for us to know how well Abraham was blessed. Turn to Genesis 24, verse 1. Genesis 24, verse 1, where the word says this. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord blessed Abraham in what? All things. What's left out of all? He was blessed in all things. And look what one of Abraham's servants says in Genesis 24, verse 35. You're right there in 24. Turn to verse 35. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. This shows that Abraham had experienced increase in every aspect of his life. So just keep this in mind. You're not fully blessed until you have male and female servants. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Now, let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to wrap this up for the day and see more about our connection to Abraham. And we're going to look at Galatians. Go, I want you to go here. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Look at verses 6 and 9. Galatians 3, verses 6 and 9. Just as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. 7. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Let me see by a, hand, uh, by a show of hands. Who here is of faith? So we are sons of Abraham. And 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, that's us by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. In verse 9, so, those, so then those who are of faith, which we are, are blessed with believing Abraham. We, as believers, we who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now, as we continue to understand the blessing of Abraham, I want to point out to you our further connection with Abraham uh, through Christ Jesus. I, was, I will discuss this in more detail later, but for now, let's look at more scripture in Galatians. Just a couple more. Galatians 3, 16. You're right there in chapter 3. Look at uh, 16, verse 16, which says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now, he does not say, this is the scripture saying this, and he does not say into seeds, his seed. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. As you know, Jesus is referred to as the seed of Abraham, singular. You're in Galatians 
chapter 3, look at verses 26, 27, and 29, and we'll conclude with this. In 26, it says, for you are all, are you there? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, this is part of the message where I'm going to talk about Jesus facilitating the delivery of the blessing. But to make clear and summarize again, our spiritual relationship with God comes as a result of our connection with Jesus. Spiritual rela relation comes through our connection with Jesus. Our physical relationship with God comes as a result of our connection with Abraham, our faithful father. So those who are faith are blessed with believing Abraham. That's Galatians 3, 6. So let me summarize, and this will just take uh, a minute, and we'll conclude today. Some of the material ways that we are blessed through the blessing of Abraham. One, we can expect to be blessed in all things, as we see in Genesis 24, 1. Two, we can expect to be blessed financially and in other material ways. Abraham was rich, very rich, so we can expect to be rich. Now, let me explain this. This doesn't mean that everyone will be a millionaire or a billionaire. Rich simply means to be abundantly supplied, to have more than enough. We can be assured that we will be abundantly supplied and have more than enough. Remember John 10.10, 10, Jesus says this himself. I come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So, number three, we can expect God's protection. We can expect him to fight on our behalf. And you remember what it says in Malachi about if you're a tither, he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That's obedience paving the way for God's protection. We can expect God's protection. Four, we can expect God, we can expect increase, multiplication in what we set our hands to. Five, we can expect our descendants, our children to be blessed. Six, you can expect to achieve power and position. Power and position. Your name will be great. That's part of the blessing of Abraham. We're entitled to whatever came upon Abraham, we're entitled to the same. You can expect to receive uh, the respect of others. All the nations will call you great. You can expect to receive respect. And eight, you can expect to receive the help you need to overcome any drought that may arise in your life. Now, uh, uh, this is the thing. The blessing of Abraham is an inheritance. It is something we get as part of the redemptive work of Jesus. And we're going to talk more about this in the weeks to come. But just know this, that through Abraham, we are materially blessed. We are materially rich. We are given all that we need to succeed in this life, coupled with the power that's been deposited within us already by the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, FrenchRChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text EASTG to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight.
we would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.